So um, again, thank you. Welcome to everybody who's joined us. Tonight is our second Frog Watch training where you will learn a lot more about how to monitor, how to uh, save your data that you're monitoring. Um, and then if you have any questions, we'll, we will be here. And again, if you just joined us, we will be using uh, breakout rooms. So today's agenda, we're gonna cover uh, details about, well, we're gonna provide reminders, refreshers about what we covered last week. If you didn't participate last week, I did share the recording. So I'm hoping you were able to see it. And if not, don't worry, I sent it to you so you could take a look at it at a later time. We will go through monitoring protocols. We'll talk about types of wetlands and how to select your, your site. In addition to that, we'll walk you through how to register your site on a field scope, and we will go through some of those details as well. Uh, general information about field scope and data entry will be provided. And I mentioned we will be breaking out into two groups, and we will walk you through it. If you're not familiar with breakout rooms on Zoom, easy. We'll let you pick um, at the bottom of your menu. There will be information where it says, let me see. I think you could see participants, chat. That's also where you can utilize your chat features. And then also you will see your breakout rooms when I'm ready to uh, open up the, the breakout rooms. So I'm going to stop. I'm going to share the results for the poll. And we could see that a lot of you, I mean, well, actually, I think it's even. Uh, we have a lot of people that know exactly where they want to monitor. And then we also have some people that are monitoring outside of Montgomery Parks, including City of Gaithersburg, City of Rockville, and Tecum Park. Okay, so remember this, and I'm assuming once you, we get started, it could change, but we'll give you options. Uh, so with that, I am going to, uh, well, I'm gonna stop sharing the poll. And then uh, I'm gonna, I believe the next person uh, will introduce themselves again in case somebody uh, wasn't here last week. So, Rachel? Yeah, all right. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Welcome back if you joined us last week. Welcome back if you're a returning volunteer and are getting a refresher and some updates on Frog Watch Field Scope. Um, my name is Rachel Gauza. I'm a Principal Natural Resources Specialist and Biological Monitoring Program Coordinator for Montgomery Parks. Very excited to be joining you and the Montgomery Frog Watch chapter this year. Uh, with me today is also Ken Mack, um, the Senior Water Quality Specialist for Montgomery County DEP. And you're gonna be hearing from both of us throughout the evening. And then of course, we'll spend some quality time together in the breakout rooms. So to get you started um, and get your feet wet again and your ears finely tuned, we're gonna listen to some frog calls and I am gonna invite you to think about each um, and figure out if you can recall what each of them is. I will also then give you a chance to populate the chat when we see how we did. But for now, let's keep our fingers off the keyboard and our ears finely tuned and we'll listen to three different local recordings, um, all from Frog Watch volunteers and all in different types of ha habitats. So you'll be learning about some of these specific habitats, uh, starting, for example, with a wet meadow. So let's have a listen to a frog species in a wet meadow. And I will play that again. They're short clips. And if at any time you're feeling kind of uncertain or uh, not confident on these, don't worry. Again, you have time to practice. You have your call charts and these are short clips. So that was like 30 seconds. You have three minutes plus in the field to figure these out. So let's move on to number two. Number 
Number two, was it a very uh, special stream restoration technique called a regenerative stormwater conveyance in DC? So you're going to hear about some different stormwater features or man-made features that could be good sites. I'll go ahead and play number two one more time for you. And lastly, we'll play a clip from a freshwater marsh along the Anacostia River down in the District of Columbia portion of it. All right, one more time. All right, bear with me while I get to the next slide. There we go. All right, so. Using the chat feature, I will play one more time. If you're feeling confident or want to give it a go, we'll play number one again. Go ahead and type in the chat feature if you recognize this sound. Don't be shy, feel free to sit. <laughs> That's okay. Because people are great tree frog. All right, no idea, that's okay too. I do encourage you again, this is gonna be part of the process is learning, listening to different clips. It's actually a lot easier in the field to hear these because you're not relying on the speaker. Um, you get the 3D effect of having both your ears out there. So yeah, for those of you that put in gray tree frog or that's where you were leaning, it is a Cope's gray tree frog, or as you may recall from last session, unknown gray tree frog is an acceptable um, response and entry for the data sheet. All right, here comes number two. Okay, we've got one brave soul. All right, and again, we are dealing with field recordings, so I know they're not optimized. There are some good guesses. The guess of wood frog was a particularly good one because you may recall we were listening for like chuckles or clucks and the distinction between the wood frog and the southern leopard frog is gonna be not only the kind of chuckles or the what, 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 but that ruh, ruh, almost like somebody's taking their hand or rubbing two balloons together. All right, hopefully you're not feeling discouraged when we hit you with this last one one more time. Anna's favorite. Ah, pretty good. Two boats for Fowler's toads. Give yourselves a pat on the back. That's awesome. So I saw American toad pop up too. That is a reasonable guess. Those two species hybridize. Remember the distinction between our two local toad species is very short, kind of nasally, kind of the little annoying brother you could use to describe the Fowler's toad. And the American toad is gonna have that simultaneous whistle and hung, hum that lasts a really long time. So like five to 30 seconds. All right, so another layer on top of this that we're gonna talk about tonight is that not only are you going to be identifying these individual species, you're going to be assigning a rating of relative abundance for them, or what is known as the standardized scale, the calling intensity index. 
So it's basically um, a one, a two, or a three based on what each species has going on with the amount of individuals that are there. Now, as you know, the whole advantage to listening is because these animals are really hard to see and get like a head count on. You can hear oodles of peepers, but might not even peep on one, for example. So the calling intensity index gives us a better sense of what the population kind of looks like there and just what the general calling calendar is. These are gonna happen where you might have less activity. It's gonna peak in activity and come back down in kind of a bell curve. So um, your scales of one, two, or three here. One is where individuals could be counted and there is space between calls. So using our friends, the spring peepers as example, it's a literal call and response where it seems like neither is talking over the other or conflicting in any way. Peep, 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 peep. If we were all together, I'd have you practice these with me. So <laughs> I'll be the one in the hot seat for now. Um, calling intensity level two ramps that up a little bit. So you're still able to have a general idea of how many species are, or excuse me, how many individuals within a certain species are there. Um, there can be just some calling and back and forth, but the intensity kind of ramps up and they start to overlap and conflict and pile on one another. So you go from peep, 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 and they start to um, overlap and you are still able to get an idea like, oh, there's about four to six there. I can hear those individual voices, but there's certainly no space between the calls, more is going on. And then calling level three is the full chorus. If we're using spring peepers as our example, again, that is the quintessential, it's a wall of sound. You're just like, wow, this is a lot of frogs here. And you're gonna be assigning this calling intensity index to each species you hear. So you may have that wall of peepers. You may recall from our last training last week, there were examples where we played the videos and there were peepers all the way in the back, like in every single recording. So you would acknowledge they were there, say, okay, calling intensity index three, let's say if they were at a full chorus, but then the pickerel frog or the other voice in the larger frog chorus, you would then be assigning one of these ratings to as well. And you'll see this come up uh, throughout tonight to help get you more comfortable with it. But just for an example, to get you picking out more than just one voice in that overall large chorus, I'll go ahead and play this clip for you, multi-species chorus. See if you can pick out the species and assign a calling intensity to it. And you don't have to put this in the chat. This is just to kind of get the juices flowing and then I'll turn it over to Ken. So let's have a quick listen again. And for those of you that were keeping track, and I'll let it play again and I'll speak through it, there's actually three voices that are gonna come through. A gray tree frog, your banjo gung -gung -gung, gray, uh, green frog, and it's a little hard to hear that low hum, but it's in there of the American bullfrog. And so we would then assign each of those one of these one, two, or three based on the degree of overlap. All right, Ken, I'll hand it over to you. Hey, everybody. It's good to uh, see you again. For those of you who uh, were here last week, and um, I'm glad you were able to join us for those of you who are new this week. Um, I'm going to be talking about the specific monitoring protocols that were uh, that the uh, Frog Watch USA program calls for. Um, we have to listen to some from fun frog calls. Now we have to do a little bit of work. All right. Um, so kind of jumping back for those of you that were here before, um, if we were in person, I would have you guys shout out to me, but because we're uh, remote, I'll just go through it. Um, hopefully you all remember the time of year that we're going to perform the monitoring. 
So that's going to be from a little bit before now, usually, actually, until the end of August. Um, and then the time of day, we all should remember it's in the evening, um, pretty close to sunset right now, looking over my shoulder. So in about a half an hour, so about a half an hour after sunset, um, but no later than um, the wee hours of the morning. So you guys want to generally stay on the, on the evening side of things. Um, the location, you want to pick a nice wetland, usually backwaters, not moving water, um, a good place for frogs and toads to hang out and to uh, breed. And then um, almost most, well, most importantly is safety. Make sure it's a safe, accessible location that you can be there after dark. No issues with wildlife, no issues with people, no issues with cars, that kind of stuff. So um, you guys have seen this, this slide before, just a quick review. Um, so we're going to talk about the site selection and registration tonight. Um, Rachel just went over the monitoring protocol. Well, I'm going over the monitoring protocols. Um, we're going to talk about the uh, weather conditions, um, go over the Beaufort wind scale, and then precipitation. Uh, Rachel just looked, talked about species and calling intensity. We went over species a little bit in the last go round. Um, we're, there's a place on the back of your data sheets at incidental notes and observations. Um, and then we're going to go through and show you what a data submission looks like. And we can either, um, there, we can provide a data sheet for you to fill out in the field, and then you can enter it online, or we may even be able to help you enter it online. Um, and then at the end, we want you to do it at least three times this year. That's a really, really low, at, low level ask. That, that's kind of the baseline. Um, and that would be sometime early in the spring, like right now, a little later in the spring, beginning of summer. So end of May, beginning of June, and then a little bit later in the year, so end of July, beginning of August. Um, that's an absolute minimum. We think you guys can do a little bit more. All right, great. Thank you, Ken. So for the monitoring protocol, again, kind of a review. We'll start to get into each of these in a little bit more detail just to make sure that you are comfortable with each element. So basically what one of these three plus visits are going to look like is you're going to go to your location at least 30 minutes post sunset, as Ken said. I know it's really tempting to go out during the day, but as we talked about during the first uh, training last week, there's this standardized protocol that's been in place since the beginning of the program in 1998. So in order for us to make proper interpretations with the data and trees out trends and look for patterns, it's important things are collected the same way over time and space. Um, we're gonna get you familiar with that data sheet as Ken mentioned. There's some weather information that goes with the frog information that you'll be collecting because as you know, and as we started to explore, our cold-blooded amphibian friends are very closely related to what's going on in their environment, be it weather conditions or other environmental factors. The actual collection protocol itself, once you're familiar with the frog and toad calls and get that under your belt, is very straightforward. <laughs> You've started to fill out that data sheet. You got that initial information in. There's an acclimation period. You wait two minutes. You can wait a little more if you want. And then you're gonna start your actual data collection listening period of precisely three minutes using a timer. So we'll review that a few times. After that, recording date, start and end time, hitting those species and calling intensities like we introduced, and those additional notes as Ken mentioned. All right, so here is your data sheet, what a typical night was gonna, is gonna look like is you'll have one of these observation data sheets. You're gonna use one of these each time you go out and for each site you visit, if you have more than one registered site that you're monitoring. As soon as you get to the site, you wanna do kind of a site and safety check. Take a look around, make sure your surroundings feel comfortable. Nothing unusual seems to be going on. If at any point during the monitoring, even if you're at minute 259 of the monitoring, something doesn't feel right or feel good to you, get out of there. As Ken was saying, your safety is what is of the utmost important. So once you, everything checks out, looks good, you're ready to listen for frogs, you're going to be filling out some basic volunteer information. Ken will take you through um, an example of this that you'll work on together. But just names yours, your site, your state, and your chapter. The chapter piece is really important. You've gone through the training. You're part of Montgomery County Frog Watch. So we want you to call that out on your data sheet 
and national um, database entry. Then the weather information you have is pretty straightforward. It's going to be mostly qualitative. Um, the quantitative information you're going to get is you're going to get your air temperature. Um, you can bring a thermometer. You can use your local weather app. Write that in. Indicate Celsius or Fahrenheit. You're then going to rate how windy it is based on a scale known as the Beaufort Wind Scale. That is right there on the data sheet, but we'll take a close look at what that means. You will see, though, again, the familiar 0 through 3 scale. But then there's also 4 and 5. There's actually levels above that, too. But those levels 4 and 5, which are basically a moderate breeze where you're starting to see small branches, if you were holding onto the data sheet and it blows away, that's going to be too windy to monitor. Um, that's going to interfere with your ability to hear the frogs. It's also going to occasionally and often influence the frog and toad behavior itself. These are sensitive, moist skinned animals, not really meant to be in a windy environment. So they'll probably lay low in those conditions themselves. Then you'll hit your qualitative information, your current precipitation, and your 48 hour weather history if there was no sum much precip and if the temperature was above freezing or below freezing over the course of 48 hours. Now, in addition to the Beaufort wind code being on the data sheet for you, another helpful thing to take a look at and that we've provided here, um, we've provided as a resource you can access off the website, is that there are wind speeds that are associated with the actual term and description. And so this can be helpful, especially when you're planning your monitoring visit. So you're like, all right, I got my stuff together. I'm about ready to hand out, head out. Let me look at the weather. You know. From a safety perspective, you're obviously going to want to avoid forecasted thunderstorms, heavy rains, that sort of thing. But you can also check the wind speeds that are forecasted. And if it's over 13 miles per hour, that's going to be too windy to monitor via the protocol anyway, you might as well just scrap it and call it a night. Um, but of course, again, that can help you figure out what um, conditions are going on. And then once you're at the site ready to take your monitoring observation, you can use these descriptors to um, put on your data sheet and figure out which Beaufort number you're at. So effectively zero, just like zero is no frogs or toads heard calling, zero for a Beaufort number means it's calm. There's no wind. If you were to light a match, blow it out, the smoke is going to rise vertically. It's not going to drift at all. Light air is probably the bulk of what you experience on a day-to-day -day here in Maryland, especially in the Piedmont. Um, it's going to maybe smoke will drift a little bit. It, you'll feel it's not a complete stillness. It's light air versus light breeze. That's when you start to feel a little bit of wind on your face from time to time. Leaves rustle or your last kind of qualifying wind category, Beaufort number three, is going to be where like leaves and twigs might kind of move and move somewhat constantly, um, but not so much that, you know, dust and leaves and loose paper in your data sheet are blowing off. All right, the frog and toad data, we've said it kind of time and time again that we have this two minute acclimation period and that you then listen for exactly three minutes. So use um, the timer on your cell phone, use the timer on your watch, get that exact three minutes. And during that time, listen to and remember all the breeding calls and then rate their calling intensity. If the monitoring session gets interrupted by something, a dog comes stomping through the wetland, there's a low um, flying helicopter, a police siren or an emergency siren goes by, that's enough to disturb the monitoring session, both for the calling frogs and toads and for you. So you would then start that portion all over again, meaning you would go back to the two minute acclimation period, then do your three minute calls. After that, you'll be noting your start time and end time, and that is going to be reflective of your three minutes. Now, another kind of couple quick notes to help you with this is if you heard, I have to identify and remember all these, that's crazy. Well, one of the things you can do is when you are initially filling out your data sheet, you can write species down and cross them out. 
if you don't hear them at all during your three minutes. Um, and I'd say too, the other really important part when you're ready to do the acclimation period is to not do exactly what you see pictured here. You don't wanna be, even if you're quiet, shining a light around and like looking for stuff that could be disruptive to the calling behavior you're trying to capture. So I'd say when you're done writing your data in, you turn that light off and you wait your two minutes. You put your hands up to your ears even, it helps you kind of really hone in and concentrate and you listen for the three. Once you have that, again, you write those species names in. Each line is a distinct species and then you rate the calling intensity accordingly. If you hear nothing, which is a possibility and it's actually okay. In fact, absence data is gonna be just as valuable as the species data itself, especially if we're looking at, you know, maybe a wetland changes over time. Ken provided that great example last week of where we had volunteers out there monitoring the location and it stopped, they stopped hearing anything. And lo and behold, when the biologists went out and investigated, there were some, pro you know, suggested problems in that area. But you want to write no species heard and mark your zero zero, no frogs or toads heard calling, and do the same when you do the entry into the national database. Ken mentioned the back of the data sheet being basically your note space, and that's going to be valuable for a lot of supplemental information. So anything that seems like it would enhance the understanding or interpretation of your data is what you would want to put there. Some notable examples, if you visually see frogs and toads while you're there, write that in. If you can visually identify, write them in. There are certainly cases where you might see a toad hop along a trail that you're walking to the wetland and you never hear the toad in that chorus, but you did observe it. So something like that. Species heard outside of the three minute period. It's unfortunate, but sometimes it happens where you're all ready to go. You've done your acclimation period. There's no interruption. You heard stuff when you were walking up to the site and then they never call again in the three minutes. Well, you can account for that in your notes, but may have to put no species heard zero, or maybe you only heard one species out of another couple that you had heard initially. This is a great space for like non-amphibian species that you observe. Folks um, sometimes encounter other wildlife. Hear um, a Canada goose, uh, see a bat fly overhead, put it in there. And especially anything that might change about the character of the site that might be especially influential. So it maybe rained a lot and it looks like it flood or if you're at a stormwater pond and it overwent a riser or that sort of thing, definitely put that in the additional notes. Um, and anything about background noise, you are going to be searching for an in locations that are hopefully quiet enough that you can hear frogs and toads as part of your site selection process. But you know, sometimes there's not enough of a noise to have to restart the period, but it's worth saying, you know, background traffic noise heard in the distance, that sort of thing. All right, I see a question popped up. If you've heard frogs as you approached and waited two minutes, and then for three, you heard nothing, can you start again with the two minute waiting period? Uh, Ken, how have you instructed folks to handle that in the past? Wow, okay. Um, so that's a really, really good question. It's a very hard question, which is what makes it good. Um, in the past, I, oftentimes when you approach a pond, the frogs will completely stop calling. I've, we've had that at field trainings. I've had that at my sites. Um, it, it's unfortunate and it is a side effect. I will often like sit there and wait until they start calling again and I'll just hold off on my monitoring. So it's not so much that I'm restarting my two minutes, restarting my three minutes. I don't necessarily just run up to the pond and, and start my monitoring. I'll sit there and, and wait. And the two minutes is, is a minimum of two minutes. So if things haven't calmed down in two minutes and they haven't calmed down and you, you're you welcome to wait longer than the two minutes. Yeah. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, the reason I punted it over to Ken too, not only for consistency for the Montgomery Frog Watch chapter is I have my like national coordinator hat that it's like the black and white protocol <laughs> would say this versus like what's really practical. And yeah, as a local biologist, sure, wait a, wait a little longer, <laughs> like not a big deal. Um, if it seems like something's going on that night, let's say, I don't know, maybe 
it rained. And for some reason that didn't stimulate frog and toad calling behavior. Usually after rain, it's chef's kiss. It's perfect. Um, but who knows some, maybe that influenced something at the pond and you didn't hear anything. It would be worth maybe getting that monitoring observation, say no species heard weird, and then going out the next day or a little later that week and having another listen. And it would be a good clue to have maybe an absence that night and a different assemblage the following monitoring observation. All right, Ken, anything else you want to share about the protocol or the observation data sheet that I may have glossed over or missed? Um, I don't think so. Uh, I think uh, we are probably ready to, uh, to move on and we can maybe look, do a quick review and then we can give one a shot. Give. All right. May I jump in real quickly? Yes, this please. is Anna. And um, so a couple of years ago, we printed out some handbooks that include data sheets. And so if anybody wants uh, these handbooks, they are outdated because our address has changed. And then now that we're co-hosting with Montgomery Parks, we don't have that information in there, but the data sheets are exactly the same. So email me your address um, and I will mail you a copy of the data sheets. It's a nice bundle. It's kind of like a notebook. It's pre-packaged, not, not this one, but the idea is like that. Um, and so um, I will also email everybody with the follow-up email and also let you know. So uh, you could send me your address. Perfect. So I have my own site and I don't use the binder, use the, the little binder that Anna's have made, Anna made. The binders are fantastic. Every time we do a field training, I look at them and go, I definitely should, should make one of my own from when I'm doing it up near my house. I, it's very helpful. It keeps everything on hand. You don't need a clipboard. You can tuck your pencil into the binding and, and you're just good to go. You grab it and go out the door. Um, so it's yeah. very nice. Yeah, I mean, they even give you a nice hard service to write on for your data sheets. So it really is a great tool and very generous that DEP is able to offer that. Um, you may be asking, why do I have to fill out this data sheet if there's an online national database? Um, the national database has been evolving over time and generally it gives a nice assurance for you. Um, so maintaining those copies for you, just make sure that you have your personal record, you can share it with us, you're welcome to email it to us and we'll maintain the record as well. Um, and also sometimes there's just not great cell service. So even if you were gonna try to use the online database and entry system directly, um, as it stands right now, it's not really offline compatible. So you might get down a Northwest branch and be like, oh man, <laughs> now what am I supposed to do? So always have them as a backup, even if you do feel pretty confident in entering the data directly. All right, so as Ken said, let's have ourselves a listen. Before I play this, is there any background information you wanted to share with folks, Ken? Um, so this is one of our local sites. This is in Meadowside um, in Rock Creek. Uh, I think Anna took this video a couple of years ago while we were there doing a field training. Um, so we're going to go through this like it's a real monitoring site. So um, as you guys follow along, if you have a piece of paper in front of you, it'd be great. You guys can write down what you hear. Um, but after we listen to this a couple of times, we're going to go through the data sheet. Um, so if we were actually in the field, um, before, like at a field training, or if I were doing my own site, before I got out of my car, I would have the observer name, the site name, the state, the chapter, all of that filled out. So my name is Ken Mack. Um, my site name here in Carroll County is Crim Gold um, uh, Recreational Park. Um, this, is, this is Meadowside Nature Center. Um, state is Maryland. Um, the chapter will always be for you guys, Montgomery County Frog Watch. Um, and then the date of the visit. Um, so today is the 18th. It's 3-18-2021. Um, air temperature outside uh, at my house, it's about 45 degrees. I don't know what, it's probably a little warmer down by you guys. Um, and then from there, I would probably just run the video in this case, or just go down and monitor and experience the rest of the conditions. Okay, so let's play this a few times. We're not going to do a full like two minute acclimation, three minute um, listening observation. Rather, we'll give you about a minute or so so that you can feel that kind of third of the time. The way this is set up though, is it is just going to be a loop. So don't let that throw you that after 10 seconds, it's going to go back and play over and over, but it's as good a simulation as any in a virtual setting, I hope. <laughs>
All right, and hopefully I counted correctly and that was six rotations of a 10 second clip. So one third of your official listening visit. So just remember three minutes is a really long time. It sounds like no time at all, but when you're sitting there quietly listening for three minutes, it actually, it's a while. Um, so I, if I were doing this myself, I would definitely start by writing down the species names that I heard. Um, so if you guys want to throw some species in the chat, Ooh, Very yes, good. There it is. Um, did we hear anything else? I'll go ahead and play it while folks are putting me in the chat. So I definitely heard um, a bullfrog. I think it was the first call I heard right when it started. Um, and then there are a couple of green frogs calling. They kind of overlap. And then there are gray tree frogs calling in the background. Um, those, those are the three that I heard. Um, I, so I saw somebody say a level one bullfrog and green frog. I think that those are good guesses. I probably would have said level one, uh, a calling intensity of one for the bullfrog. I probably would have given green frogs a calling intensity of two because there are a couple that overlap um, kind of in the middle of the video. Um, and then for the gray tree frogs, I would have said a calling intensity of two because the, you can hear they're coming from different locations and they're overlapping. Um, so those are your three species. Um, I, and there's some subjectivity to the calling intensity. Um, if you are there and you've got peepers just going nuts and they're, they're just drowning everything out, it might be much harder to call like call that an intensity too for green frogs because you're probably not going to be able to hear anything that's across the pond from you. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a tough metric, um, but do the best you can with it. Um, the more you listen, the more experience you'll get and, and the easier it'll come. Um, so from there, we have the species, we've got the calling intensity. Um, did you guys see any, um, any ripples on the pond? Did you see any of the leaves moving? Did you hear any wind noise in the recording? Um, I, I did not, so I would say that it was calm. Um, calm is, is generally unusual. I would actually say that's probably the, uh, the least um, used of my Beaufort wind scale, at least where I live. Um, but like, if you look at the pond, it is dead calm. There are no ripples at all. I, I don't really think the tree across the way was moving, so it could be a zero, maybe a one. Um, hard to tell on the video. Um, did it look like it was raining? Any precipitation? Did you guys see any, any, rip, any of the water drops on the water? I didn't, um, so I would say that the precip uh, no precipitation. Um, and then in, at the bottom, it says use our um, conditions for the last 48 hours. Um, so how about you guys? Did it rain a lot at your house in the last 48 hours? Um, it, we got monsoon on, on and off over the past 48 hours. Uh, it, I, my backyard started to flood, <laughs> so much precipitation. Um, and then finally, it was has the temperature been mostly above freezing or mostly below freezing? Um, so in my, at my house, um, we actually got pretty close to freezing last night, but even if they had just gotten a little below freezing, you would still put mostly above freezing because in the last 48 hours, the majority of the hours have been above freezing. Excellent. All right. So that was kind of a start to finish pre-data entry. Um, what do you need to do now that you understand the protocol and get out there? So... Um, one of the things you guys have to do is, is establish your monitoring equipment list. So if you um, get in touch with Anna and she sends you a binder, your equipment list gets shorter because your top two and three, if you tuck it in the binding, um, items on this list are all together. So you need a copy of the monitoring protocol and a data sheet for each visit. Um, that would be in your binder. Um, that binder can also be your clipboard. Um, and then you can, a pencil, I don't really like indelible ink. I'm as a field biologist, I like a pencil. I use, I've always used pencils. I have fancy space pens that write and are waterproof and a, a pencil is just easier and it always works. Um, a thermometer, I use the thermometer on my car when I pull in. Um, I also check the weather app on my phone. I do that before I leave because it tells you the, whether it's gonna be above or below 42 degrees and whether it's windy or not. Um, so you can use a stopwatch, a wristwatch, Oh, excuse me, or a stopwatch app. So I, um, I use my watch because I wear a watch. Um, not everybody does, um, but a stopwatch app is really good. I would recommend against using the timer on your phone because at the end, 
you usually get like a loud buzz or your phone rings, right? And that's just going to disturb the whole pond. Um, it's generally not a great thing to have happen. So I, I usually, if I'm going to do that, I would use the stopwatch over the timer, um, even though the timer can be very helpful. Um, take a flashlight. Uh, if you have, like my son goes with me a lot, he gets to carry the flashlight. It's very exciting. Um, I use my phone as a backup flashlight. Um, so you always want to take your cell phone. Um, it's good so you can get in touch with somebody if there were a problem. Uh, you can also use it to record calls if you're hearing something that you don't expect. Um, and then if you guys are on private land or if you are on park land, make sure you're carrying your permission letter. If somebody stops you, a police officer, um, somebody, uh, the landowner, wherever you happen to be, you can hand them the, the permission letter and say, I, I really did. I went through the, the process of getting permission. I'm allowed to be here. Um, so this optional at the bottom, if you guys have your uh, binder, it has um, a good bit about our local frogs and toads to work as a field guide. Um, you can take a tape recorder. Um, lots of folks have been using either a digital camera on video or their cell phone, works really well. Um, and then rain gear. So always dress for the weather. Um, dress probably a little warmer than you think you need to because you're doing this in the evening. And as, uh, as it cools off, like as the sun goes down, it cools off a lot. Um, so especially early season, think extra layers. And you're also standing there for three minutes, which again, does not sound like a long time. It is a long time to sit there very still. Yeah, that's a very good point. And especially if you are, you know, going to a site that's going to require a little bit of walking, maybe you get there before sunset and you're going to hang out for a little bit. That's when like the chill can really set in once the sun goes down and you're not moving around and as active. Um, we had a question come in. I saw that Anna responded to it, but in case the group isn't keeping an eye on the chat, a uh, question from Alice is, can we record the calls for later verification? That is a great thing to do. Um, we actually added a new frog species to Montgomery County because some one of our frog watchers recorded the call. Um, and that's how we added green tree frog. So if you guys want to record the calls, that's a great idea. It's a great quality control check. Um, and, and we are happy to listen to them. I love getting recordings of frog calls. Yeah, I would echo that same sentiment. Um, try not to lean too much on like, I'm going to record this for three minutes and then listen to it over and over and over again until I get it right. Like that's kind of a little less authentic. And certainly like folks in 1998 weren't really afforded the luxury to do that. But as Ken said, and as Alice was suggesting, yes, verification, it's absolutely fantastic to have and I like it as well. In fact, that's how some of those videos that you guys were listening to with us earlier, they were all for that purpose. In fact, the one Southern Leopard Frog was an instance where the volunteer didn't quite recognize it. And you could even hear her say, I think it's coming from this pond as <laughs> she was recording it. So we're just as excited as you all are to hear them. We're happy to have a listen. All right, so knowing before you go, come. So I as we've been talking about practicing your calls, um, it's really hard. Calls are hard. I have, a, I'm completely tone deaf. I really, I, I was, I had a terrible time with frog calls um, and bird calls and I had to learn them all in college. So you just kind of have to figure it out. For me, I watched YouTube videos of these frogs making the calls and that was enough to make it click. Um, and then second, gather your equipment, make sure you guys have everything together. Uh, my equipment, my data sheets, everything, they live in my car because I know I'm going to drive my car to my site. Um, it's not a whole lot of stuff, so it can sit on the, uh, the back, one of the back seats and it never gets bothered. Um, before you guys go, and we're going to cover this shortly, um, register a site or adopt one of the park sites and then go to that site while it's still daylight out. Um, if you're picking someplace that you know really well, that you, it's probably already taken care of, but you don't want to walk to somewhere for the first time in the dark. It's very hard to do. It's, it would be easy to trip. Um, you don't know where that those thorn bushes are. You might trip over a, uh, a, a stump or a log. So it's just best to, uh, to have been there because um, you are going 30 minutes after sunset. And then watch the weather, make sure it's appropriate for monitoring. So above 42, not raining too hard, not windy. Um, and then make sure you're dressed for it and prepared. Uh, and then if you guys, it, it's always a good plan to glance at the, uh, the calling chart before you go out. It gives you an idea of what to expect kind of, um, and you can even listen to some of those calls before you go and kind of prime yourself. Um, and then most important, stay safe. Um, I think we brought this up last time, it's the cicada year. So pretty much everything is gonna be more active. All the animals, you're, you're more likely to hear frogs, you're more likely to see them, snakes, um, other things. I mean, certainly I, I, I've watched um, foxes go around, go around and just picking up cicadas off the, <laughs> off the ground. Um, 
there are all, there's all kinds of wildlife out and about, and you, you guys want to be safe and don't want to disturb them, and you want them to stay safe. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. So let's get into the meat of the site selection. We're going to share some things that are basically going to be universal truths for whether you're monitoring on parkland or off of parkland. Um, and then we'll get into the breakout sessions and cover some of the little extra specifics. So as a refresher, wetlands. So frogs and toads need water to breed. Uh, bottom line, so it needs to be a wet area. There are three things that define wetlands. Maybe you guys remember what they are. Um, it's the presence of water, that's an easy one. Um, the soils that don't have any oxygen and then plants. Um, so those three things combined to create a wetland. Um, they can be big, small um, or natural, man-made and they can be temporary or permanent and that can be on a many scales. So they could be permanent one year and disappear the next. Um, wetlands uh, are, can be very ephemeral. So we're going to talk really quick about the types of wetlands. So as you go to register your site, you'll have to be able to identify these types. Um, so marshes are frequently covered in water. So my background picture is kind of the edge of a marsh. Um, <laughs> um, vernal pools are um, wet ponds that fill up because of precipitation, so rain or snow, and then they dry out over time. Those are really, really important for species of frogs and toads um, that don't survive well in, in bodies of water that have fish. Their tadpoles don't survive well with fish. Um, swamps are saturated, They're, they have some water um, and they tend to be low in mineral. Um, so, and they, they tend to have big woody plants. So think about like something with big deciduous trees in it. Um, bogs and fens are both dominated by, by a peat, some sort of peat. So in a bog, it's usually sphagnum moss. Um, in a fen, it's usually much more diverse than that. We actually have a fen in Montgomery County. Um, there are a lot more nutrients in a fen, so they tend to be these little biodiversity hotspots. It's pretty cool. Um, they're really, really neat wetlands. And then kind of your most common ones are ponds. Um, and there are old farm ponds, there are ornamental ponds, like people put ponds in their yard, and then golf course ponds. All of those are appropriate to monitor. Um, some other ones, that we, so there's another category on the data sheet. So streams fall in that. So we're not really monitoring moving water. You wanna monitor backwater areas because frogs and toads, so tadpoles aren't super s strong swimmers. So they don't like to hang out in the current. Um, their food sources generally aren't out in the current. So they, uh, they do much better in backwater areas. Um, and then stormwater management facilities. So Rachel had played that recording from the RSC, Regenerative Stormwater Conveyance. That's an example of a stormwater management facility. Um, we have wet ponds, which sometimes get called ponds, and if that happens, it's okay. Um, dry ponds, so sometimes these dry ponds have small wet areas, depressions in them, and that's very common for toads to use those. Um, biofilters, rain gardens, anywhere where you have water that, that hangs out for a little while, or all places that you can run into um, different amphibians. Excellent. And Anna put um, a reminder in the chat for us that my green Montgomery.org Frog Watch. We're continuing to post resources and make them available and at the tip of your fingers. And there's a nice chart that gives you some like vegetative indicators, how long the water's there, whatever. And also some species associations because some of those habitats, you may be more likely to hear certain species than others. So we do encourage you to keep kind of working through some of that information. So selecting a location, um, Anna had sent around um, a NIFT little tool we're trying out this year that is a web app to help you look at existing sites and help you um, come up with new sites or find your coordinates to a site that's local to you. And I'm going to do a little quick walkthrough of a couple scenarios for you all. So you can access it via either of these links. I made a little bitly to try to make it a little more intuitive and descriptive. And I'm going to pop up not that one, but this one. <laughs> All right, so this is your Frog Watch Locations web app. You're gonna be greeted with this little splash screen um, that gives you some tips and strategies for using the map. You're, you can click in the lower left-hand corner not to show the splash screen, but we'd encourage you to leave it on each time because it has those reminders. And it even helps you with some next steps of like how to visit an existing site versus how you might locate a new site and then share it with myself, Anna, and Ken. 
So once you navigate away from that splash screen, you're gonna see the Montgomery County outline with some features on it, including some colored pins. Those colored pins each stand for something a little different. If I hover over here, it tells you, oh, that's my legend button. I can open that and it's gonna let you know about those existing sites that were registered by Frog Watch volunteers or chapter coordinators previously. So any that you're seeing here in orange are on parkland and you would reach out to me about like, hey, that one looks great, I'd like to do that one. Any yellow, DEP, and any of these dark colored pins are gonna require kind of an extra step. Um, they're a TBD, if you will. So for example, if I start to zoom in a little, we'll see some of those fall in the Gaithersburg area. So Anna had mentioned city of Gaithersburg as the landowner of those parks may require some additional permissions. So just another consideration. I'm gonna keep zooming in. And as I do, now we see more things adding to the legend and getting drawn. So now we can see where some of our streams are. Um, again, we can more clearly see boundaries. And if I click on this pin, I see this DEP site, Crabs Branch Pond, and a little bit of information about it. Its name, how it's gonna appear in the national database, Frog Watch Field Scope a description, so it was one that DEP had selected and registered on behalf of folks. And then there's even um, links to navigate to that site via Google Maps or Waze. Now, a word of caution about that is just like any time you would use those apps or functions, it's gonna get you to point A to point B as fast as possible. It's not gonna take into consideration where you're parking, if you're hiking, things of that nature. So it might get you there, but always read the directions field if it's there. This is what the individual volunteers or the coordinators have put in to help orient you. And so right here we see, oh, no good parking, that maybe this is a better poised um, stormwater pond for folks that live in that neighborhood or are part of that homeowners association. We can go over here to one of our park sites, for example, there's this option to zoom in. And so when I do, I can get a closer look at the, um, the paths to get to that pond. If I click on it, I can even learn about that path. Like, oh, sweet, it's a hiking, biking trail. I could bike to listen to this location. Um, you can also, once you're zoomed in, change the base map. So while this is great from a zoomed out perspective, you know, you could add on your aerial imagery, any number of things that might make it a little bit more informative. So I could pop on that and see a little bit more. And oh yeah, I can definitely see that. I can see where this observer was listening that they were far enough away from the pond. Um, da, 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 da. You can also turn on the wetlands layer. We have two available for you. When you do, um, I selected the one from the Department of Natural Resources for Maryland. So this is every state level um, mapped wetland. It might not call it get all those tiny little things like those little ephemeral vernal pools, but it'll get some of the big ones as you can see. So let me swap my base map back because I'm gonna continue to kind of move around here. Oh my gosh, okay. And I'll go to streets maybe. All right, and you can see that even as I zoom out a little bit and move, look at all this red on here. So you could go to any given location and you might be able to dive a little deeper. And that includes outside of Montgomery County as well. I mentioned that that national wetland inventory was um, available. The Department of Natural Resources one is statewide. So if you're listening in PG County, keep using it. Uh, if you're listening over the Potomac River down to Virginia, you just switch on the National Wetlands Inventory. So there's an other few tools that might be of use to you. Uh, let's say that you want to listen to a site that's near where you work. So if I wanted to do that, I would select our Park and Planning Headquarters and also where DEP is now located. Is it gonna go? There she goes. 
and it's going to apply a filter here or kind of a radius circle within five miles. I can adjust it more or less, and then it's going to show me what locations are available. So I can see, oh, cool, there's one in Sligo Creek Park. Maybe I'll head over there. And you can get that same information that you did um, in the pop-ups previously. So you can see the directions. You can see site established by Friends of Sligo Creek. Awesome. You could um, elect to search nearby if you wanted. So we already have it um, selected. If I head back in, for example, and I turn my wetland layer back on, I'm like, okay, cool. I want to do that one. Oh man, look, there's some mapped things over at Kemp Mill Urban Park. Or if I'm taking my bike, I could bike right up here and I could check that out. So this is a good tool that you could use this weekend. You can get your ideas, plan some things out, and then go out and check them out this weekend so that you're ready to monitor. Now you'll see as I move my cursor around the map, down in this lower left-hand corner has your coordinates. So it's gonna change based on that. We um, can get coordinates a couple different ways. You'll see I'm hovering in the very left corner in this little cross-like icon. When I hover, it says I can click to uh, the map to get coordinates. So I've clicked it. Now I can go over here and precisely, boom, drop my pin. So that's where I'm gonna listen and look down in that lower left-hand corner. There are my coordinates. That's what I'm gonna use for the site registration process. Um, alternately, if you wanted to share that location with me, it's on Parkland. So you're like, hey, Rachel, can I go do this one? You're gonna hit the share button and you'll see there's a share. You can either share the link to the app itself or take a couple extra steps. Um, you can go through, I hit that kind of expanded options. There's this add a marker on the map, this very last bubble. I'm gonna click that little marker again, and this is gonna work just like dropping a pin in Google Maps. So I'm gonna listen right there. I've dropped my pin. And then it gives me this link and I can copy and paste this link into an email to Anna, to Ken, to myself, and it will take us right to this exact map with the pin zoomed out right here. Um, so it, there's a lot going on. Like I said, you can kind of hover and get a description. There's things like you can filter. Maybe you only want to look at parks. You can filter for certain wetland types you're interested in. So continue to play around with it and then just let us know if you have questions. All right, so let me get out of that. Recording, yes, please. Okay, so working with coordinates, if you're going to use that tool, um, you'll already have it in our required format. And that's at decimal degrees. You'll see this number will be either 38 or 39 point bum, 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 four different placements of precision, comma, negative 76 or 77 point, bum, 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 bum. So hopefully the tool makes it a little easier for you, but if you're comfortable with Google Maps or another way of generating coordinates, you're more than welcome to do it that way um, in order to generate your sites. And so you can see an example of one of those regenerative stormwater conveyances down in Pope Branch Park. And as we've talked about, it's important to add in those additional directions and supplemental information so that we understand exactly where you're listening from. Because some wetland features can be quite large. And I do see we've got a few different questions that have popped up. Ken's done a great job answering those. Uh, Ken, are there any that you wanted to highlight for the group? We've got a couple of good questions. Um, so Ray asked, um, how do we know if others are monitoring the same site? Um, and that actually falls in line with Hannah's question. Do we need to notify you once we select a monitoring site or just record it on our data sheet? So we would ask that you notify us if you select an existing monitoring site. Um, it, it would be helpful to us so we can help coordinate between groups or individuals who are monitoring in the same area or at the same site. Um, it certainly happens. Um, Rachel has a lot of pre-registered sites for Parkland. DEP has eight or 10 pre-registered sites. Um, uh, on our stormwater management ponds, and we'd be happy to work with you guys to help um, organize um, the monitoring. <clears throat> the other question is, is there a minimum distance between sites? And I don't think there is a minimum distance between sites, I, not officially. Um, I think I would suggest having sites spread out far enough that um, you're not overlapping, you're not hearing the same frogs. 
Um, but at the same time, if you do want to monitor the same site as somebody else, you guys can either monitor on different days um, or you could monitor together. Um, I, the different days option is really good because it allows us to cover more time. So on a, if you guys are monitoring every Tuesday, um, you might catch one set of frogs because it just rained. Or if you're monitoring on Wednesday, it, it wasn't raining, you may hear different frogs. So um, I, there's absolutely nothing wrong with monitoring the same site and there is no minimum distance. Um, but I, I don't know that, uh, yeah, if you guys want to monitor in the same place, just let us know and, and we'll help you work it out. Yep, that's perfect. And yeah, the distance between different sites is a tricky one, as Ken was saying. Um, sometimes something is functioning as a wetland complex. So you are hearing what's basically representative of the same population. So this could happen yeah, along a lake, let's say there's some nice marshy habitat. They're all using that same portion of the marsh. So you just are able to stand there. You're good to go. Um, we've had instances where we've brought up like those um, stream restoration projects where they've almost made individual pools. And for some reason, some pools work really well. Maybe they have less velocity. Maybe they hold water longer. And frogs use that little pool, but not that little pool right there. Um, or like in the case of my neighborhood site, um, I have an artificial pond and also on my property. And then adjacent, there's like a flooded forest and another wet meadow. And I've definitely heard different species use those different habitat types. So that would be the other consideration is if the habitat is substantially different between those close sites. So Rachel, um, along those same lines, a common question that we get is if you are standing at, um, say you're standing at a pond and you hear frogs calling behind you from, could be tree frogs in the trees or it could be a little vernal pool in the woods, something along those lines, would you still count those frogs? I tell people not to, rather you make that an anecdotal observation. So you would only monitor for the wetland feature that you've registered and you're working on. And you can either register an additional site if that other area, you know, you're able to tell where that little vernal pool is tucked away and it happens to be accessible and you have permission. Um, or it's just a, I hear this in the background sort of situation. And in fact, like an example, I can point out to, again, the recording quality wasn't the best. Um, but for that southern leopard frog, there was an adjacent site. And in the background, that kind of high pitched whistle hum was actually American toads. And so that was a different monitoring site, a whole different tributary that folks had to go to and listen to versus just what was going on there. So do your best to get the community at the given wetland long-winded answer for that but <laughs> so one, one more question before we move on um how large is a site that is another thing that i don't think is like firmly defined um it's gonna be anything that can retain water for long enough to support some level of species breeding and some species breed very quickly, Eastern Spadefoot, American Toad, um, others a little longer. So I don't know if I have a better answer than you do there, Ken. <laughs> no, I think that's a good answer. I think that's a really hard question. Um, mm -hmm. I, in, so I, I'll, I'll take it back to this. The site that I monitor regularly um, is probably a, a 12 acre pond that extends a couple hundred yards to one side, I'm, I'm right at the headwaters of the pond. Um, I think you could comfortably put four or five sites on that pond and be look, and be listening to different groups of amphibians. Um, there's a little beaver wetland in one area, there's a, a spring coming in. Um, so I think Rachel really hit the nail on the head. You're trying to define the community that lives in your little wet area. So if that happens to be a one acre farm pond that is behind a farmhouse, that's different than if you're in a uh, like the marsh behind me. So this is a marsh on the southern eastern shore of Virginia that is, um, I mean, probably 30 square miles. Um, so it, you could have thousands of sites in that location, even though it's all the same marsh. Mm -hmm. So you're just trying to characterize that local community. Very good. All right. So one last piece we're going to cover as a group before we hit our breakout groups. And I do see um, some good questions related to parks and what have you. I'm going to ask folks, if you don't mind, 
to ask those again when we head to our respective breakout groups. Um, but Ken, if you want to introduce folks to Frogwatch Field Scope, I know I'm going to mention it again in my breakout room as well. So don't feel lost there. Or if you prefer for me to do it, I can do that too, whichever is easier. I can do it. Um, so I'm going to go through this really quick as we're running behind, um, and I apologize. Um, so I'm going to request control here real fast, maybe. All right, I will approve that as quick as I can. There we go. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so uh, this is Frogwatch Fieldscope. You guys can see in the top left, it's frogwatch.next.fieldscope.org. Um, this is the current field scope. It no doesn't use Flash any longer. It got updated this year, uh, which has been both good and bad. I think it's actually a little easier to use, so it's probably good for you guys, but we lost some of the historic data. Um, so I don't, we have a lot of new folks, so we're going to create a, an account. Um, so this is pretty straightforward. Um, so you're going to put your email in, hopefully correctly. It's a lot of pressure to type in this live setting. I found I always get twisted up. <laughs> I'm usually pretty good. Um, I just put a random password in, put your name, school organization. So I'm. Yep. So this is whatever is relevant to you. Yep. So this don't feel like specific. because you're a DEP oriented volunteer, or because you're monitoring Parkland, you don't have to necessarily specify there or you so just put unaffiliated. Yeah, um, this school or organization, you have to have a response, but it could be unaffiliated. Um, I, we've had people do this for school before. We had a Girl Scout troop do this. Um, we've had a bunch of different organizations do it. Um, so this is the really important part. You wanna put um, Montgomery County Frog Watch. So that'll, um, that means that Rachel and myself and Anna, we can pull your data up separately, um, hopefully. Um, and then put your address. So this is wherever you live. Um, street address, city, state, zip code, and then your phone number. Um, and then you hit sign up. So it's pretty easy. Um, I, I'm a member already, so I could sign in. Um, so Rachel, do you wanna hop back to the slideshow? So this is really easy. Um, it's like signing up for anything else. Um, so then the other, the next part of this is the um, data entry. Mm -hmm. So let me, oh, I'm sorry, can you? <laughs> Yeah. I, you know, I can't do that. I forgot that this isn't on my computer, so I can't okay, do that. I sorry. I should have insisted, like, no, Ken, I will not switch back to the PowerPoint. All right. Go ahead sorry. and sign I, in. I actually <laughs> have it open on my. <laughs> we're all doing our best in this virtual world we were thrust yeah. into. <laughs> no, we did this already today. <laughs> well, that's not what I was looking for. Hopefully it's not being wonky because that happens. Right. So yeah, I go ahead and try that. adding data. <laughs> so when you guys want to add data, you'll go up here to this green button that says add data. Um, so uh, did I do anything with that? So we're going to go over how to register site in my breakout room um, because Rachel already has sites registered. But because I actually did my site yesterday, which is Crim Gold Park, um, we're going to enter my data. Um, so the observation date, that was yesterday. So it was 3-17-2021. Um, the start time was at 7.45. So that was at roughly a half an hour after sunset. And that's 7.45 p.m. And so can you guys type in the chat what time my end time was if my start time was 7.45? Sorry, Ken, Ken, and this is something that's a little tricky in this new version of FieldScope. Once you enter your time, there's that little OK button in the lower right hand corner. So make sure you don't miss that or it does that little annoying thing that just happened to Ken. And I have to be a little bit slower and more deliberate because I did click it, but I was moving the mouse too fast enough mm. out of my computer. So did, oh, did anybody respond? So the, the time is 748. So there you go. We have someone that yeah, popped in. Excellent. Um, so 748 is your time, it's exactly three minutes. It's always, always, always exactly three minutes. Outside of safety, that's probably the next most important thing to remember. Oops, if I, if I say that, then I don't click <laughs> that button. Okay. 
man. But getting enter doesn't work either. Um, so air temperature, uh, it was right on the cusp of monitoring yesterday at my house. So it was 42 degrees Fahrenheit. You see degree F, um, if you guys are doing it in Celsius, you leave it as degree C. Um, it was calm yesterday. It's never calm here, um, but it actually was. It was dead calm, completely calm. Um, it didn't rain while I was there. Um, I, we didn't get rain uh, last night. We got some during the day. So it was some precipitation in the last 48 hours. And then the temperature got close to freezing, but stayed above freezing. Even if it hadn't, it was mostly above freezing. Um, and then very, very sadly, it was dead quiet. There was no wind, the beavers weren't out. I mean, this usually there's stuff all over this, these ponds and there was nothing around. Um, it, was, it was eerily quiet. So that's really important data too. So we're gonna put no species heard and call intensity of zero. So notes, uh, ponds were very quiet. I didn't take any photos because there's nothing to take photos of. Um, I don't know if you can update, upload your data sheets here, but I think it, I think that is possible. It'd be a great idea. If you guys record audio, you can upload it here or video. So it's kind of a cool option. Now you don't have to enter all your data. Um, the day you have, the day you do it, the day after you do it, I recommend you do it pretty quickly. Um, so you remember some details if you forget to write something down in your data sheet. Um, but I often batch enter. So I'll hit save and add another. But in this case, this was just one observation. So I'm going to hit save observation. So you guys can see there's my site way down. Zoomed in too far. Okay. Um, if you guys have any questions, you can put them in the chat box. I would actually suggest at this point, save your questions for the breakout room okay. and put the chat put them in the chat there just in case okay, that's right because with the chat so we don't miss any yeah. yeah so i think with that um anna is going to give us a very quick review of what to expect in those breakout sessions assuming i'm clicking the right things yes great thank you so if everyone remembers at the beginning of our session we started speaking of we had a poll going and we just said, uh, where do you plan to monitor? On Montgomery Parkland, and I know the park on Montgomery Parkland, but I'm going to need some help finding a site. Or you said both on and off of Montgomery Parkland. So if you chose those three, I'm gonna open uh, rooms or the breakout rooms. If you chose those three, you go with Rachel. If you're monitoring on your site, uh, at your yard, in your yard, or in your neighborhood, or in a county right of way, then you are going to go and, and pick Ken. If it's outside of Montgomery County, you also pick Ken. And if you're not sure, pick Ken. And don't forget, uh, I know, pick Ken. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the other thing is that these record, the, we're recording the session, and we should be able to provide you with both uh, uh, Rachel's a breakout room and then also Ken's breakout room. Uh, does everybody, let me see, let me just walk you real fast. So the breakout rooms, I will launch the breakout rooms. You get to pick, you can come out of them. You can come back into it. Uh, and I will monitor that in case somebody comes out to the main session because I'm going to go with Rachel. And I forgot to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to my colleague, Ryan Servi. Ryan Servi has volunteered to be with us tonight to help out. So Ryan will go with uh, Ken uh, just to make sure that everything's uh, working appropriately and that we're answering uh, questions on the chat room uh, or the chats. And so I am going to launch the open the rooms and pick where you want to go. I am back. I am unmuted. Everybody's going to come in muted, but you are more than welcome, I think, at this stage to unmute if you had any specific questions. Um, I know Ken will be joining us shortly, too. Uh, we can review things, pull up slides, pull up sites, anything that you need. Um, if you're still like, whoa, that was a lot of information, because <laughs> yes, it was a lot of information. And thank you very much for hanging in and sticking with it. Question, how do we request permission from the city of Rockville? Um, Anna and Ken, do you have any pro tips or insight there of how volunteers may or may not have been successful? I have a contact as well, but yeah, Kenny. 
Um, so, but the existing sites that show up on the map, I think, are part of the Muddy Branch Alliance monitoring network. Um, so we would probably, I would suggest we get in touch with Muddy Branch Alliance in addition to um, uh, getting in touch with Rockville. So that, that's an existing watershed organization. They've been monitoring there for many, many years. Um, I don't know if they predate our program. They'd be, if they don't predate our program, they started the year we started. Um, so th there's a long monitoring record there and, and cooperative monitoring is always good. Yep. So in that case, the very first um, step would be to email Anna and Ken via the frogwatch at Montgomery County md.gov address. But if you email parks, I'll help you too. But <laughs> they're the best one stop, most direct way to help you out with that. All right. Is anyone monitoring Redgate Park? Is that familiar to Ken? You'll have to forgive me. I've worked here for about a year, so I'm still learning the lay of the land. Is that the golf course? <laughs> Yes. Okay, um, so that is a new park, and I think that's City of Rockville, mm. too. Okay. Um, so uh, that would probably need to go the same avenue. We'll have to put you in touch with uh, our contact at City of Rockville. You guys, like I said, though, you shouldn't be new to the City of Rockville. Um, like, Frog Watch isn't new to them. Uh, Muddy Branch has already gone through the process of getting permission with them. So I, Am I no? It's not Muddy Branch. That Muddy Branch is in Gaithersburg. Maybe That's City of Gaithersburg. Yeah. Yeah. Watts Branch has the site in Rockville. Gotcha. Watts Branch. Yes. All right. We've got a anyone monitoring Tuckerman Pond. When I googled, it's a stormwater pond that looks like it's a DEP. I don't uh, think we've had anybody monitor monitor that in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Grace, those Dennis Avenue stormwater ponds, I think would be great. <laughs> um, okay so the, i'm gonna do a direct message while you do that sorry okay um so dennis avenue stormwater ponds are generally good um they are doable uh they can be a little loud so you'll probably just have to you may have to wander around the edges a little bit um for those who monitor in the Watts Branch watershed, we'd like to publicize through the Watts Branch Alliance. And you can work with me to figure out how best to do it. Watts Branch Alliance has started up again. I love it. Yeah, me Good. and Ken um, and Anna. And Ray is on the board. Thank you. This is awesome. That would be great. Yeah, there's, I know folks have already shared some videos and different things on social media where they've gone along Watts Branch and the wood frogs were going crazy. So I think you guys are really going to do a great job capturing information that we haven't gotten in that area um, outside of the stream corridor work in a while. And just double checking, Rachel and, and Ken, if it's windier higher than four, then it's a no, no monitoring. Okay. Mm -hmm. and that's yeah, you can't hear the frogs, but especially when you're back in the in the woods, there's also a safety aspect. Um, I we we internally have had to stop going out in the field when it's windy. We've had crews have branches and trees nearly fall on them a couple times. So um, it's it's it really is a, a safety issue. So if it's windy, be very careful. Don't go out. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Ryan Zerby, everybody. He helped us out. He's given us enough of his time. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. Uh, no problem. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. All right. Um, is Sligo Creek a good spot or would it be better to pick still water? I would suggest still water. There may be little elements of Sligo Creek that fit the bill, but for the most part, the way Sligo Creek kind of parallels Sligo Creek Parkway and has been changed over time and has kind of fast flowing riffles and stuff. Frogs and some frogs will utilize that habitat, but not for breeding really. But there are some interesting pond features along Sligo Creek Park Trail, including vernal pools that were created that I think can um, had mentioned in the first training, but um, I can certainly help you find some of those. They show up nice red blotches on that Frog Watch app map. Um, let's see. Yes, someone asked, do I understand right that if our site is not on the map, we get a GPS and email you? Yes, please, um, please do. And then I, Lynn, I'm not sure whether uh, you were with me or with Rachel. Um, if, if you want to do a new site that is not on parkland, um, you register the site yourself uh, as we went through, and then um, you email us and let us know 
uh, where it is. And again, if you're registering your own site, it's less likely that you're gonna overlap with somebody else, but it's really good to know. Okay. Or pin on the map and email the link. Yep, yep. absolutely. Um, uh, so name, name the site something that makes sense to you. Um, that is a good geographical feature, a, uh, an intersection, a nearby road, um, uh, a park name, if it's a local park or a, a non-parks park. Yeah, and I usually say like as a default kind of naming convention, nothing perfect, but like, yeah, a park name and what the feature is. So it could be, of course, I immediately blank on a city of Gaithersburg Park. Um, uh, Washingtonian Woods, Swamp, or Lake, or, you know, whatever features there, just to call it out, because there may be a few different features in Washingtonian Woods, and sure, you could end up with a duplicate swamp name, but we can deal with that if that happens. The percentage of that is relatively small. Um, is there something you can send us that gives step-by-step -step directions to register a site? I think that's a resource. I have right now a resource that gets you to register in Frogwatch Field Scope, that kind of step-by-step -step review. But between Ken, Anna, and me, yes, we can get you exactly how to register a site in Field Scope, no problem. And Melissa has her hand raised. Oh, sorry, Melissa, I was staring at the chat. <laughs> yeah, I have a question about the uh, Frogwatch map. Um, so when you um, did the map and had the pins on the map, um, what I noticed was that we were monitoring two sites um, this past season, and they weren't actually located on the map. Um, can you speak to that? Sure. So it is a bit of a moving target with the national database. Um, I downloaded these sites prior to the conversion from the Flash-based version over it's possible I did not have access to all the sites at the time I downloaded it. Um, there are some things that if like you marked your site private or somebody flagged a change that needed to happen in the station information, or maybe even the observation was flagged in the old system, those would sometimes get hidden. So like you'd still see it as the observer, AZA would still see it, but me as Rachel Q. Parks would not. Um, so don't fear that they're lost. They just might be temporarily hidden from immediate view for us. So the two steps I would say to do so is- what, what, So one of the sites was actually public and we continued monitoring it, um, I guess with another person. So I'd be kind of curious why that particular site is still not visible because we uh, joined in in the monitoring of that particular site. Another site we added, so maybe the way we added it, but the, the first site was a public site that was visible. So I'm kind of curious about that. Absolutely. Um, and so then the um, Tuckerman site that I had posted, um, that was actually not visible last summer. And you had mentioned that that's been monitored for a couple of years. And that site was actually not visible at all. That actually resides in our community. And um, we had chosen not to monitor that because of the steepness of the hills going to it. Um, and, uh, but I be, we were debating, um, maybe we monitored uh, this year um, just to add to it. Um, so it was kind of was surprising that um, it's now visible as a, a site um, this year. So we were just talking about it amongst the children. Um, yeah. So, but that was definitely not visible um, in the summer of 2020. Understood. So I think there's two parts we can speak to. I'll reserve the Tuckerman part for Ken. Let me back up just to how to double check where some sites may have gone, because again, this is this flux year. When you log into Frogwatch Field Scope, make sure for you, the site name as you named it still appears from that list of all stations. If you don't see it there, send an email to frogwatch at aza.org with your information, what the name of the site is, and you ask them where it is. We're still doing some work on our end to make sure we account for it because we're here to help you guys with your chapters. 
but at the end of the day, it is AZA that is responsible for when there's a database problem and you can't see your data. So it's definitely not lost by nature of how the database is set up on the back end, but it's hidden. It's MIA at the moment, if that's the case. But just because it's MIA in the FrogWatch web app map does not mean it's MIA from the national database and you can't enter your observations there, nor does it mean it's gone in the back end. Um, Ken, any thoughts on Tuckerman? Again, I still can play the new card. I've only really worked here a little over a year, but. <laughs> well, I had to step away for a second. Um, okay. <laughs> I apologize. I was Sorry. With preschooler issues um, past bedtime at this point. Uh, I, I, I missed what we said about Tuckerman. Um, if I can summarize, jump in, Melissa, if I misspeak, but it was that Tuckerman was not displaying as a registered pond that was available to be monitored in the summer of 2020. And um, it was maybe not a great candidate because of the steepness of the hills. Is that correct, Melissa? Well, more just because of it, I was going out with my kids, but just that you said that it has been monitored for multiple years and now it's visible on our end. It was just more of a comment that it's more like sites are disappearing and sites are coming in and it, it just wasn't, you know, there's a lot of, I guess, fluctuation between what's happening with the sites on Frog Watch. It was just a, more of a comment. Um, and I, didn't, I don't know how many people are, um, new versus returning. So it was just uh, something that I noticed when you pulled up the map. So I, yeah, I'm, I'm very sorry about that. And I, I think Rachel did talk through that. It's just been, it, it's been a struggle on our end too, because we had certain expectations, the same as you guys did, and then they were gone. So um, I, I would suggest everybody reach out. If, you, if you're missing a site or data that you've collected isn't showing up, reach out to Frogwatch and let them know. Um, the more voices we have to reach out to them, the more likely they are to make a change. Yes, that's correct. But I would say let's definitely continue this conversation a little more offline so that maybe we can do some extra detective work and I can get more familiar with your sites. And then, yeah, we can all kind of figure out um, what's going on there. But the Frogwatch web app map is a Montgomery Parks product based on what was accessible to me at the a discrete download time. So that was, I don't know, near when I first started. It might even been a year ago. Lynn has her hand up as well. I'm a little thick and all these different places where we go, I'm gonna have to go back and watch the video and try to catch it. But I think I understood that if we want Montgomery Parks, we would look on that map, drop a pin if it's not already there and then create our own name or Rachel creates our name for us and then we email. Is that, is that a good summary? It's a reasonable summary. If it seems mm -hmm. complicated in that way, you are more than welcome to email frogwatch at montgomeryparks.org and say, I'm really interested in Kent Mill Local Park. And we can work together from there to pick a location, for example. So Does I have a sp spot right by my home. And what I'm thinking is there's probably three spots within that spot where frogs will be. So I would like to register all three and I would like to name them so that I can tell the difference. So is that a name I give or is that a name you give? I think that is a name we would give together because I have a naming convention that I would like things to stick in, but as you as the responsi responsible volunteer and as the person that is more familiar with that area than I am, I think we can come up with something that'll work well. So if you, if this has been a lot to process, which I completely understand also it's late and everybody's tired and past toddler bedtimes, <laughs> um, please, or preschooler bedtimes, you can just email me directly at frogwatch at montgomeryparks.org. And I will also work with Anna. Maybe we'll smith the wordsmith some things and come up with some resources that'll be helpful to folks to remove some of those barriers. Cause we don't want it to 
something that was a three minute listening protocol to turn into something that's like, I can't even sign up. This database is ridiculous. You're ridiculous. I'm out. Like, I don't want that to happen. So it is a transition year, both for the database. And I came on board and mucked up the eight year running strong chapter. So thank you for bearing with us as we figure some of this out and iron out the kinks. We've, we've been lucky to have, we are lucky to have Rachel um, being the national chapter coordinator originally, um, or I guess not originally, but going back a few years. So um, Rachel's expertise is, is absolutely welcome. Um, and I, she's that breathed new life and uh, more organization into the program. All right, friends. Um, so it is past nine. Um, what I would propose doing at this point is everybody's dismissed. I do see two hands up. I'm willing to stick around for another two minutes <laughs> to help the folks that have their hands raised. Um, otherwise, look for more communication from Anna. Reach out to us. We're here to help.